I want to talk about a problem called the eight queens problem. This is a classic. The idea is you're playing chess and you want to try to find a way to put eight different queen pieces on the board in such a way that none of them are in the line of capture of each other. And so I think if you know your chess, you would remember that queens can move and capture in any of the four directions or diagonally. And so you want to set these queens out on the board in such a way that none of them are able to see each other and capture each other. You understand? So like if there's a queen right there in the top left square, it wouldn't be okay to have one here because those two queens would be able to capture. So how do you find such an arrangement? Well, I mean, I showed you one. <laughs> so the point isn't that we don't know if there is one or not. There's one right there. But my point is I want to write a program that will look around on the board and try to find such an arrangement. And you could even generalize this problem, call it the n queens problem, maybe an n by n board. You try to place n queens on it and see if there's a, an arrangement for it. Okay? So for any of these problems, uh, it's all about what we call choose, explore, unchoose. So <clears throat> what are we choosing and exploring and unchoosing in this problem? For any new problem, we have to try to figure out what the choices are that our algorithm is going to try out, right? What do you think the choices are for this problem? Somebody want to help me out? Do you have an idea, sir? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Are there two of you? I'll let you go first and then the other guy. Go ahead. Yeah, you first. Oh, yeah. yeah. He said position. The different positions on the board? Okay, so try putting a queen somewhere, like here, and then explore other places I could put queens, and then come back. If I don't like that, I'll remove the queen and try putting it somewhere else. Right. Okay. You see my little blue icon, right? That means I'm going to ask you a Socrative question. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, Here's an algorithm that kind of implements what you were saying. I mean, maybe not exactly, but this is an, a proposed algorithm. Is <clears throat> For each of the squares on the board, I will try to choose placing a queen there, and then I will explore placing the rest of the queens anywhere on the board, and then I will come back and unplace the queen there. So what, how many, if I were going to draw a tree of all the calls, all the possible things this, this algorithm could do, how big would the tree be? So I want to ask you that to vote on that. Just a second. Let me get that up as a question on the screen here. Quick question. Multiple choice. OK. Take a look. What do you think is the size of the solution space there? Give it a look and give it a vote. Please feel free to speak to your neighbor if you want to. Profros, you can just do yik yak during this time. <laughs> I know that's what you're doing. more seconds and then I'll show the votes. Here's what you guys think. We got, we got a fair amount of C's and a fair amount of D's with a scattering of other ones. Um, D got the most votes. D is uh, 64 times 63 times 62. I think I would choose D. C is very close. They're both really close to each other. So these are both pretty good answers. I think of it as you can't put two queens on the same square. So you're kind of finding eight unique squares out of 64. 64 choose eight. I think that's the closest answer, D. But C is very close. These two numbers are very close to each other if you actually multiply them out, right? So I think those are both pretty decent answers. OK, well, what is 64 times 63 times 62 times 61 times? It's more than the cost of tuition at Stanford. That's how big that is. <laughs> it's a really big number. And I don't really want to write a program that has to look at that many different options before it finds the solution. That's going to take a while. Maybe you don't yet have a good instinct for how long, how long would it take the computer to check that many outcomes. It would take a while. It would be a slow program. I don't want to write that program. I think we need to come up with a way of optimizing our search a little bit. I talked about this a little bit when we did. Uh, we did dice roll permutations or dice roll combinations that added up to a certain sum. And I told you that a good thing to do there 
would be to not go down paths of the tree that were unlikely to produce a good outcome, right? Can you tell me anything about outcomes that we know would be good or bad that maybe we could avoid uh, <clears throat> that we could avoid searching, you know, outcomes that are we know right ahead of time are not worth exploring. Do you have an answer, sir? Yeah. Oh, like outcomes where it's in the same row or column as the initial as In the same row or column as the one I've already placed before. Is that what you were going to say? Something similar? <coughs> same for you? Or somebody else had, do you have a different suggestion? Yeah. Any that are within one diagonal space of each other? Sure. So I think these are all good suggestions. If it's, like, in my, in my picture there, um, I've got a, uh, oops, where did it go? I've got a square being used by this queen right there. And so I know that any square that's diagonally removed from that queen or any square in this row or any square in this column, those are all squares that are not going to lead to good outcomes, right? So let's just not try them. Let's not even explore them. If you really think about it a little more, what you'll discover is that uh, any solution to this problem like if I go back to the, uh, I did it again. <laughs> Sorry, the button for uh, switch to full screen, by default it jumps to the start of the, of the slides. So this is a, a, a correct solution. And any correct solution is going to have a, a property that I think we could take advantage of, which is that every row has exactly one queen in it. Right? I mean, that's got to be true. Because if you had two queens in the same row, they could attack each other. And if you had zero queens in a row, just by the pigeonhole principle, there's going to be some other row that must have two or more queens if one of them's empty. So they all got to have exactly one queen per row. Same with the columns, exactly one queen per column. So if we took advantage of that, I think a different way of looking at it would be to say, let's just think of the columns and let's place a queen in each column. You could also do this by the rows, but I'm just going to go by the columns because you could do it either way. Let's just start with this column and try to put a queen there. And then let's explore where we could put queens after that in subsequent columns. There's no need to try putting any other queens in the same column anymore, right? If we did that, what do you think is the size of that solution space in terms of the tree? It was 64 times 63 times 62, et cetera. What do you think this one's like? Like how many branches come off of each piece of that tree? See this, Profros? Get awkward silence like this at Berkeley. Come to stand. Uh, somebody's hand was up. Where was that? I missed somebody in the back. Yeah, what do you say, sir? Was what do you say? Eight? Yeah, it's more like each one's. It, it splits in eight, so it might be like eight times or eight to the eighth, or uh, eight times seven times six, and something more like that, right? That's a lot smaller than sixty-four times sixty-three times sixty-two. So let's try to write this thing, and let's try to write it more in this sort of a way. I think you could even think about optimizing it further, but this alone will be a big help. Now, uh, to do this, I've brought in a piece of code that I already wrote, and we're going to interact with it. I've written something called board. And it's just a representation of the chessboard. It doesn't do this eight queen algorithm for us. We have to do that part. But I have a chessboard. You can put a queen at a certain row and column by saying place. You can remove a queen by saying remove. And you can ask whether it would be safe to put a queen somewhere. Basically, that is safe checks all the, you know, can anybody attack anybody? If I put somebody here, is that going to be OK or not? So those are just operations we can use. If I didn't bring this in, we could have written this part of it ourselves. But this isn't really the recursion part, so I just wrote that already. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to go to the Qt creator, and I make a board of size 8. And I want to call this solve queens function that takes the board as a parameter. Okay. <laughs> and we have to write the body of this function. Okay. So <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? Well, we're writing recursive code. When we write recursive code, what do we usually think about? <laughs> Base cases and recursive cases? OK. So if our decisions, if our choices that we are making are about putting queens in columns, it seems like the base case is when there's no work to do usually. That's usually what the base case is for these backtracking problems, right? How do we know how much work is left to do in this problem? 
how is that information represented, or how do we know the amount of work remaining or the amount of work that's been done? What, what do you think? If the number of queens we have to put is zero. The number of queens that we have placed is eight, or the number of queens we have left to place is zero. So how do I know how many queens we have placed or have left to place? I don't know that that information is in the program anywhere yet. How do we know that? I mean, that's exactly what we need to know. So how do I make the program know that? I hear some people saying stuff. Do we want to give me an, an idea, a suggestion? Yes? Just make a helper function to keep track of that. Make a helper for that. Great. So almost every backtracking problem you ever do, you need to make a helper function. I'm just going to lay that one out there for you. There's a free tip from me to you. Uh, helper function. We probably want some more information, some more parameters, and it's not here. So let's make a helper that has that information. And, and so can we be more specific? What If we make a helper like void queen's helper, then what stuff do I want it to have as parameters now? Let's see. So maybe still the board. We still need to know what the board is. What else? Number of queens, is that what you're going to say, sir? Yeah? What do you say? Yeah, uh, so they essentially, I mean, like, we know that the number of queens and the number of columns are, like, there, should, there would be one queen per column, right? So do we even need a helper function? We know that if the number of columns are eight, so we have, like, physically performed our... Well, I, I, the way I would think of it is we need to know what call, like each call to this recursive function needs to do part of the work. And we need to have enough parameters so that every call knows which part of the work it's responsible for. And so a given call shouldn't try to do all of the queens. It should only place one. And to know which one, we probably need to say, you do column one, you do column three, you do column six, et cetera. And so either we should pass how many queens we've already placed or what column we're looking at or something of that nature. I think an int is kind of where we're going here. So my suggestion would be to pass the column of, of interest. So why don't we say like int column? And then this is where we'll write our real code. Down here in the original function, we'll just make this thing call our helper. We'll just say queens helper board. And what column should we start at? Maybe column one. I forget. Does the board use zero based or one based? I don't remember. Uh, zero, zero, three. Okay, zero based. So I guess we start at column zero. My slide looks like it's one through eight, but I should have written zero through seven. So we'll start at column zero. Okay. Can we think about base cases for a second? If, if we pass in zero, that means we are at column zero. We're trying to place a queen in column zero. That sounds like a lot of work to place all these different queens. What's an easy case where we don't have much work to do? Do, do you have an answer to that? Yeah. Uh, the case in which you have work to do would be case eight. So you've already placed all of your queens. If I get to column eight, then that means I've placed everything. So this board class has a, a you can print it by saying see out board. So if I print the board, it'll show me where the queens are currently at on the board. So maybe that will help me see, you know, if I get to this point, I've done all the work. But otherwise, then what I need to do is I, my call needs to place one queen in this column. So what that means is for each possible place that I could put it in this column, I need to choose that place. I need to explore what could come after that place. And then I need to unchoose afterward, right? So for each possible place in the column, that means for each of the rows within the column, right? So that's all the rows, one through eight. For each uh, row equals zero. Row is less than eight. Row plus plus. For each row, I want to choose, explore, unchoose. OK. How do I choose? Well, that involves interacting with this board, I think. So let me show you the methods of the board again. So how do I choose in this problem? If it's safe to go there, then place a queen there. Yeah, that's exactly right. We don't want to place a queen there if it's unsafe. So if it's safe, if the board thinks it is safe to place a queen at this row and this column, then I will, I guess then I will choose it, explore it, and unchoose it. So choosing it means board.place a queen at this row and column. Exploring, hmm, we'll deal with that in a second. And then unchoose is just board.remove from this row and column, right? How do I explore? What do I say to explore? Yeah. 
Want to finish it? Yeah, go ahead. Board and column plus one. Right, so explore almost always means make a call to my own recursive function here, call itself, but pass in slightly different parameters so the next call will do a different chunk of the work. I handled this column, the next call should handle column plus one, and so on. Eventually, hopefully, we'll get over to eight, and then that will cause the board to print out. Okay, so let me compile it. Uh, oh, can I, can I? Find what is it dot two string actually? I think I think I have to say two string. What function not allowed here? What's happening? Uh, what have I done? I think I'm missing a curly brace here. You see, my if is not. Let's try again. We'll run it, and what do I see? Whoa, a bunch of stuff is happening. Uh, no, but this is good, right? Look. Look, don't I have a solution here? And then I have another solution here. Right? That looks pretty good, doesn't it? So, okay. We did it, basically. <laughs> That's our solution. I want to show you a couple variations of this solution real quick. A couple variations. So, um, let's animate this thing. Let's animate this thing. So, I think there's a method that I put in the board, the secret method, called uh, board dot set delay, if you put like a 100 millisecond delay, what that'll do is every time you do stuff to the board, it'll draw it, it'll animate it. So I, I think that's all I need to do. Let me try again. It's going too fast. Let me, hang on, hang on. More like 400 milliseconds. This is like, you know, ghetto fabulous animation right here, by the way. Watch. Here we go. Ready? So look what it's doing. It's trying up. Oh. Going back, trying, go back, try, 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 almost there. Ah, oh, go back, go back, go back, try, try, go back. So we're watching it choose and explore and unchoose kind of in real time here. They're animating this algorithm. And what happens is like it gets almost all the way there, but then it can't quite place the eighth queen in any column, and so it has to unwind until the next one. And if in any given column, if it tries all the rows and get all the way to the bottom without finding anything, it has to unchoose and back up. So you'll find that like it'll stay on you know the fourth queen for a while, but after a, a while, eventually it'll move on to the next one. So like in terms of like which queens appear and disappear, move around more quickly, the ones that are further to the left stay still for a long time. All of the current animation is with the first queen being at row zero, column zero. And we've, we did a lot of exploration with the second queen being right here, and that didn't lead to anything, so now we're trying one with the second queen being right here. And so anyway, you can kind of watch this thing go, right? And I mean, eventually we're going to get one that works. But <clears throat> one problem with this algorithm, whether you animate it or not, it, um, let me turn the delay off again for a second. If I run this thing again, it produces a lot of outputs. It basically finds every possible solution, which is kind of cool. But what if I wanted the algorithm to stop after finding a single solution? Stop after finding just one solution to the problem. If you look at our code, we found a solution right here, right? If we get there, that means we placed all the queens without being safe every time. So we sort of want to get here and say, like, stop. <laughs> stop the recursion. I want to get off, right? Um, but how do I actually do it? Well, some of your initial instincts might be wrong. If you said, like, return or something, go home, go away, or whatever, that actually doesn't do it, doesn't work. What I really need to do is stop all future calls from happening. There is a command called exit to exit a C++ program, but I don't want to do that. I, <laughs> that's, that's the nuclear option. I don't, I, don't, I don't want nuclear proliferation right now. So um, how would I achieve this? How would I make this stop with just one solution? Do you have an idea? Okay. You could have a global boolean variable and then turn it to be like false at the, at the beginning after you get the initial result of the return that to I feel the same way about your suggestion as I feel about my ex-girlfriend. I both love and hate your suggestion. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let me repeat what she said because it was a really good idea. You said make a Boolean value that's a global variable. And you said maybe like bool finished equals false. 
And then here, if I get the solution, then I'll say finished equals true or something like that. And now in the code here, maybe I'll say if it's finished, I'll stop the rest of the looping and stuff. That's a really good idea. I love that idea. What I don't love is the global part of it. Global variables are usually bad style. I, I don't want to resort to that here, but I really think you're on a good track. The thing is, at this point in the code, we know something. We know that we found the answer. I really want that information to get back to all the other calls so the other calls will know that they should stop. So how do we get information back from a method to the place the method was called from? Do you have an answer, sir? Yeah. Yes. We can make um, Queen's help return a Boolean. Why don't we use this exact idea that I love and just make it be a return value that comes out from the function. So make this return a Boolean. And the Boolean, basically, it returns true if it found a solution. Uh, False if not. OK, that's what we're going to do here. So here, if we print the board, I will say return true. OK? And here, so I guess the way you want to think about it is like this is the last call, the eighth call. Down here are the other calls, looping and waiting and trying things. So here, those other calls are making the call to this one right here. This thing is going to return a Boolean. This is the subcall. Like if I'm call number six, then this calls number seven. Or if I'm seven, this calls number eight. And this thing is now going to return to me a Boolean about whether it finished or not. So I could say bool finished equals the result of that call. That would be OK. So now whatever they returned, I captured it as this Boolean variable. So what should I do with that variable? The whole point is if they finished, if they found a solution, I should stop working, right? So what I could say is, well, if they finished, then what? What should I do? Return true? Right, basically stop. If, if they found the solution, I should stop, right? But I shouldn't just stop. I should also pass back to the person who called me, hey, they found a true. That means I found a true. That means you found a true. We all found a true. So it is kind of global in the way that you said, but I want it to be kind of global to this function and its calls of each other. You know what I mean? So. If the subcall finished and found an answer, then I myself will also indicate that it was true. I found an answer. You, a big bug that a lot of people have is they write else return false. Why do I not want that? Do you know what's wrong with that? What, what do you think? Yeah. Um, because like, if you try one path and it doesn't work, you'll return false even if the next one you make works. Right. You don't want this because it returns too early. This is like, I'll try the first subcall, and if it failed, then I'll give up. I need to not give up yet. I need to try the second, the third, the fourth, all the possible subcalls. Yeah. I just was wondering why, like, when you had it as void, just doing return would work. If you say void, you're not allowed to return on a value. You can write return semicolon, but that just goes back to the one call why before you. you return it if, like, why doesn't that stop once we've done Well, this stops if we do find a solution, which is good. Right. But the return false. We don't want to stop yet because we need to keep looking. Right. So. I mean, like before we did this tool method, like when we when we had it as like a void function, right? And you were like, we just want one solution, right? And you said just putting a return semicolon. Oh, in. just like return. Well, the reason that wouldn't help would be because they would return back to here, and then this call wouldn't know what to do, wouldn't know if they found an answer or not, so it wouldn't know whether it should stop. So the return, if I had just said return here, that would have gotten me out of this call. But that would have sent me back to here on the prior call. And the prior call would have had no idea of what happened on the call after it. So it wouldn't know what to do. It wouldn't know how to react. So anyway, if they found a solution, I'll stop. OK? So question, what happens if I loop through all the rows, and I get all the way done with this loop, and I don't return anything yet? If I get down to line 51 here, what does that mean? What should the code do at this point? It means I tried all the possibilities, and none of them worked. I never returned a true, so I should give up and return false. So OK, what does this all do, all these changes that I made? It makes it so that when I run this thing, I get one solution, and then it stops. That's what this does. And I think you should put a little star in your notebooks or whatever. If you Do, do people even use notebooks anymore? Uh, Smash your Snapchat and take a picture of this, or whatever you do. But um, remember this stuff, this Boolean stuff. This is useful stuff for your homework assignment. Remember this stuff. Make a star. Because sometimes you want to stop after finding one solution. Sometimes you want to find all the solutions. If you want to find all the solutions, write it the way it was before with void and all that. 
If you want one solution, stop once you find it, return information to the previous calls that they can see that will make them stop. If the previous call finished, then I return a true. See that? Okay?